Lauren. So go ahead, John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marty. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity. And first I wanted to say, uh, uh, introduce myself. I'm John Dickinson. I'm the project technical lead for OpenStack Object Storage, uh, also called SWIFT. And uh, I wanted, uh, I love giving these updates and the opportunity to do them uh, every at the summits and then now in this uh, webinar format. It's something that I always look forward to. So I definitely want to say thank you to Margie and the Foundation for the opportunity. Since we didn't have a chance to do it in Hong Kong, I'm, I'm grateful that we can do this uh, here this morning. Uh, so today I'm going to cover uh, three basic things and then have some time for questions at the end. Uh, cover what's been going on with the contributor community, what uh, some of the major new features are, and then looking forward, uh, where are we going, what's in progress, and what are we, what are we working on currently. So to start with, uh, looking at just the community growth and uh, who's contributing and how that is taking place. First off, uh, we've got now, I think as of yesterday, a grand total of about 144 uh, people who have contributed to SWIFT uh, over the lifetime of the project. And uh, 63 of these uh, contributed in the six months of the Havana release cycle. Uh, what I really like about this is that we had 35, we had uh, over half of them, uh, 35 new contributors were uh, uh, new to uh, contributing to the project here. I've got their uh, names on the screen right now. Uh, and one thing that's not shown uh, that's really nice about this is uh, these 35 contributors actually uh, have 21 unique domain names in their email accounts that they're contributing with. Uh, some of that's a little uh, a little fuzzy because some people may contribute from a, a personal email rather than their uh, their employer's email address, but uh, it still gives a, a nice measure of the uh, broadness and diversity of the contributing community, and so that's something I'm really uh, grateful for and happy for. Uh, during the Havana cycle, we had nearly 400 patches with over 1,700 reviews, uh, and to all of these people. The 63 contributors, the total of 144, and the 35 new contributors we have. Uh, thank you. It is yeah. – yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I think the slides aren't moving, so maybe maybe put them in presentation mode if – we'll reshare if you don't mind. Uh-oh. Okay. Well, let's do it this way. I can see the title slide. Okay, you can see that, and you can still see my slides here. I can just see state of the project. Okay, that's odd. Okay, well, let me walk through it this way again. Um, can you see? Can you see the? Can you see my slides now? I can't. Although you know, it worked for everyone us yesterday. So there's maybe little glitches in these in this application, but um, maybe I need to reshare. I'm just it's stuck on the one. We had some similar issues. Tuesday, even after it was working fine, so I apologize. Did that change anything there? Yes, yes, that did. It, if you're able, if it's to put it in pre-zone mode, that's great. If not, the slide, oh yeah, good. That, and then I think you just have to move that, that box. That, yeah, that it's working. It's just 35 new contributors. So then I think you just have yep. to move that gray box down, if okay. possible. Everything good? But if not, we're good. Yeah. Is everything good? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, so very much uh, to all of these contributors, um, I definitely want to say thank you. Uh, Swift is a world-class storage system. It's running massive, in, uh, massive clusters in production all over the world because of your efforts, the people who are contributing into the project. So uh, to that, to all of these contributors, uh, very much, uh, very big thank you and very strong kudos uh, are uh, deserved by everyone. 
So a couple, uh, to call out a couple of people specifically, um, looking at over the last uh, six months during the Havana cycle, um, the, looking at who's contributed the most numbers of patches and has done the most reviews uh, within SWIFT. And in isolation, uh, these, these numbers are, don't mean a whole lot because you, know, you need to have good patches and you need to have good reviews. But very, uh, very much I wanted to call out both Peter and Sam because they're incredibly prolific members of the community, uh, always on IRC in addition to contributing uh, lots of patches, doing lots of reviews. And so they are actively making Swift better. So both to Peter and Sam, uh, I again say thank you very much. Looking at overall who is contributing into Swift, uh, the top uh, half dozen companies or so that are contributing, uh, these are the ones that really stand out. Uh, these companies are active in doing code reviews, uh, contributing code, uh, actually building and deploying production clusters uh, at scale. And uh, so SwiftStack, Innovant, Rackspace, United Stack, Red Hat, and IBM have all uh, been talking about uh, and participating in the community. And at, in Hong Kong, at the last summit, uh, there were quite a few new things that these companies came out with and talked about. So SwiftStack talked about uh, Concur and a production global cluster uh, that's, that's running today. I'm going to cover that in just a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, we. Uh, SwiftStack also talked about uh, a new hard drive platform from Seagate uh, called the Kinetic Drive Platform. Rackspace talked about their, uh, their numbers related to uh, they're the largest publicly known uh, Swift clusters today. Uh, they talked about uh, their, their massive traffic levels and the fact that they're running uh, 85 petabytes uh, in their clusters right now. Uh, Enovant talked also about one of their large customers, and they have a 20 petabyte cluster deployed uh, in France which is really exciting. I know that Red Hat and IBM are building out major product offerings uh, related to OpenStack and uh, specifically around Swift. And so to all of these companies, uh, again, thank you very much for your work and your continued contributions into Swift. And John, I'm sorry to interrupt you again. I think this oh, is with meeting burner at scale. Is this honestly was working very well for us yesterday with three people. Um, it's not. It's just not advancing. Do you... Um, do you want to send me the slides or a link and I can and give that to everybody and you can just speak to it or um, I don't know if you have to reshare again and I, I apologize because it was working fine yesterday. I think there's an issue with this when uh, we have more people. So we'll probably try another platform after this, but thank you for your flexibility. What do you see now? Major new features. Yeah. And the major contributing company. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me just walk through it this way then. Um, and we'll, yeah. we'll go from there. Okay. That sounds good. Thanks. Sorry. So after talking about the, uh, the, the, the major uh, participants in the community, uh, the, the broad diversity there, moving on to, okay, what's the exciting part? What are the actual new features and new things that are enabled uh, in Swift these days? So the first thing I want to talk about is global clusters. This is absolutely the biggest uh, feature that was added in the last uh, – uh, several months, um, and it's it's really great. So let me cover a little bit how it works, and then talk uh, talk about it. So I've got a little video I'm going to walk through here. So I certainly hope that this works. So the first thing is uh, in this example, I've got a a cluster set up in both Portland and Hong Kong, and so a user will be able to write a web app, and uh, they will uh, with GeoDNS, and then they're going to be routed into the data center that's nearest to them. So if they're coming out of New York, their, their request is going to go into Portland. So the data is written with replication for durability, just like it always is. Uh, and then uh, Swift will automatically replicate the data to the second data center. And then once that is confirmed, the replicas are removed from that first data center. And at that point, right then, you've got DR support and, and ability. Uh, now, the user is able to read from their tablets and see exactly what's there. And the, interest, and the great thing about this is in addition to the data, uh, the, the DR, the disaster recovery, and the high availability there, um, users are then routed to their, um, their, locus, uh, their closest uh, location as well, which is dramatically improves their performance and their responsiveness. So uh, to talk a little bit more about how that is actually running today in production, 
uh, Concur uh, got up on stage and gave a keynote at the summit. And Concur is a company that makes travel and expense reporting tools for enterprises. They have a mobile app that allows you to take a picture of your receipt with your phone and then expense it. And so Concur was looking for a storage solution that was extremely reliable, supported their mobile device use case, and improved the service levels they were able to offer to their customers. And so they chose OpenStack Swift and gave a keynote at the Hong Kong Summit to talk about it. And so they have integrated uh, it into their existing infrastructure, which was a heterogeneous uh, infrastructure including a massive uh, Microsoft uh, installed base. Um, they are currently adding more than 10 million uh, images a month, and they now have a solution that enables them to grow uh, and scale to billions of images over the next, over the next few years. So uh, the really great thing that Global Clusters in general is going to give you is that you have the ability to have a globally dispersed cluster set for a wide geographic area. So the uh, advantages here for service providers is you get to provide uh, fault tolerant infrastructure that is what uh, service providers expect and demand from the, the uh, software that they use. Enterprises, on the other hand, um, are already used to running in multi-DC uh, designs and uh, having multi-DC architecture. And so uh, Swift gives you that uh, today with global clusters. Uh, it's in production today. You can use it today, which is uh, something I'm really excited about. So we've got some other improvements coming to make global clusters even better, um, and I'm going to get to some of those in just a little while. But first I want to cover some of the other new features that have been added into Swift over the last six months. So uh, first, uh, one, of these thing, uh, one of these things is a comp D style config. And this is something that allows uh, operators to make composable configuration settings. And that offers easier system, uh, system admin uh, management. It makes it easier to extend Swift with additional functionality, and it uh, makes it easier to integrate with uh, management tools for your Swift cluster. Uh, another major improvement was the fact that we added in Google Memcache connections, which lowers the resource overhead for each request, uh, thereby improving uh, performance for uh, both uh, the requirements for the, the deployed hardware, but also uh, improving the performance for uh, end users. Another uh, major ongoing piece of work is improving the replication process. Uh, we've made some improvements, and these are ongoing as well, uh, to improve how the uh, replication transport actually happens. And this allows us to build out some new efficiency improvements within the system internally. And uh, the, the end result of this is that we're going to be able to lower the failure detection times and the recovery, the automatic failure recovery times uh, by making all of these processes more efficient. So this is ongoing work, um, but it's something that we've uh, definitely got some major improvements already in the code today using. Uh, another major uh, performance improvement uh, that we've been working on is getting uh, better disk I.O. performance. Uh, one of the things that uh, it's generally pretty common about switch clusters is that storage nodes are typically very dense. Uh, you've got 12 to 24 to even as much as 60 or 90 hard drives in a single server. And uh, we've made significant performance so that each drive's workload, not just each server's workload, but each drive's workload is isolated. And this means that a busy or failing drive won't cause performance hits to other users of the system, whether that's uh, system background processes or even, again, end user performance uh, will not be impacted simply by uh, one hard drive uh, failing or, or uh, being under load. Speaking of hard drives, uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier uh, is uh, support for uh, Seagate's new kinetic platform uh, that uh, is, was demoed in Hong Kong. Uh, as a proof of concept of saying, hey, look, guys, this can work. This is something uh, coming down the pike, and it's, it's really exciting. So Seagate kinetic drives are different than normal uh, hard drives that we've all been used to. First off, uh, they do not have a block interface with a SATA or SAS connector. Instead, uh, they have a key value interface where you say, I need to store this data with this key and then you speak to the drive over an Ethernet interface. 
And so you get something, a, a hard drive that itself has a native objects uh, model. It's, uh, it's object-based data, and you don't have to worry about uh, a lot of the abstraction layers, uh, everything from uh, you know, weighting controllers and uh, caching systems to uh, the, the VSS system at Linux to POSIX to uh, all of these different things that are uh, between the application and the actual storage. And so it's an exciting new platform that uh, is able to, be, to improve the overall efficiency and, uh, and, and improve the cost uh, uh, parameters of a building out a SWIFT cluster in the future. Uh, these are things that are uh, going to be, I think, hitting the market in 2014 sometime. So looking at uh, going forward, uh, one of the things that I like about the kinetic drives and uh, where that comes in is that it, it starts really exploring the flexibility of choice that deployers have in order to make efficient deployment decisions for their specific use case. So SWIFT has always been all about using standard off-the-shelf commodity hardware and uh, you, the, the software itself will work around uh, any failures and uh, allow you to take advantage of whatever the, your deployment is. But the way everything has been built right now is that you have a single replication policy. You can change that in a live production cluster over time. But your, your replication policy is going to be, look, we have three replicas of all of our data in the system. At the same token, you want to be able to uh, potentially uh, put SWIFT uh, on, uh, in, uh, make SWIFT take advantage of existing uh, storage systems that you may already have deployed. And so we've, what we've got uh, in progress right now uh, that uh, we took advantage of in building out support for the kinetic drives and then uh, Red Hat is doing some product uh, offerings around taking advantage of this, integrating with Gluster, uh, is the concept of storage policies. And storage policies are something that I'm really excited about. Uh, and they're basically made up of three different pieces. Uh, given your overall sets of hardware that you can, that you can build out your SWIFT cluster for, uh, when, when storing your data, you basically can choose now, you'll, you'll be able to choose three things. One, what subset of hardware is that going to be stored upon? And uh, the, an obvious uh, description of where this uh, may come into play would be choosing a particular geography of hardware. Or uh, you, know, you might do an East Coast and an, and an EU and a, and a West Coast and an, and an Asia uh, set, uh, regions. And you can choose what subset of the hardware is this going to be stored upon. In, if you're not using global clusters, you may want to instead say, hey, here's high performance hardware and here's low performance hardware. And I want to deploy, store this data on uh, SSDs and I want to store this other data on SATA drives. So the second thing is after you've chosen what subset of hardware you're going to store your data on, at that point you want to be able to choose how is it stored across that subset of hardware. And so you may choose that I need to store my data with a standard three replicas for high durability and high availability of the data. Uh, but there's some kind of data that you may want to store slightly differently. Uh, you may, if, for example, if you're storing a lot of images, you may want to store some thumbnail images at uh, two replicas because you can recreate those and you don't need the as high durability and you want to save some costs on uh, storing the data. So you may choose that I want this to be uh, my uh, EU cluster with reduced redundancy, and I want this to be my West Coast, uh, California, uh, full redundancy, and I want a uh, four replicas uh, on a set of data that's, that spans the globe. And so when you combine the subset of hardware you're putting things on with the encoding that you're actually using, uh, then you get a lot of flexibility and, and, and uh, empower to match the, uh, the specific deployment you have with your specific application use case. And so the last piece here that uh, you'd be able to uh, choose as, as you're building out the SWIFT cluster is what we're actually, after you've chosen what subset of hardware you're using and you've chosen how you're going to store it across that subset of hardware, then at some point you need to actually talk to a hard drive. And so what protocol are you using to talk to that hard drive? So, for example, today, 
uh, in, in Swift, we pretty much assume that you're speaking to a local POSIX file system. And there's been some work uh, right now that's, uh, uh, to take advantage of abstracting this and allowing you to talk to other kinds of storage volumes. One example of this that I mentioned earlier is the kinetic drives, uh, not speaking a non-POSIX protocol. Uh, another example that uh, has been uh, in development is being able to talk to cluster volumes rather than uh, standard uh, uh, local file system volumes. And so the combination of these three things really allows deployers a, a massive amount of flexibility in how they can build new things. So obvious first use cases uh, include you know, being able to do reduced redundancy, being able to have performance peers, being able to specifically control your geographic placements uh, while maintaining as a, a unified uh, cluster uh, on its, its globally uh, deployed. And so definitely stay tuned here. There's a lot of exciting work going on. And I'm really excited uh, what's happening. Uh, the, the people who are really uh, leading this effort, uh, the, the major players who are, are uh, contributing uh, code, uh, the, the refactorings and the code needed to do this, uh, include SwiftStack, Red Hat, and Intel. And the interesting thing is that this, this work has a specific end goal. What we're trying to do is allow deployers to use non-replicated storage inside, or, uh, inside their Swift cluster alongside of their replicated storage. Uh, erasure codes are an efficient way to store data with very high durability uh, by cleverly encoding it and striking it across a lot of drives. Um, it is really good for certain use cases, specifically when you're talking about storing large, colder content like backups or VM images or things like this. And so uh, you can, deployers can save a lot of money by being able to uh, uh, store things with erasure codes rather than doing a full replicated system. Uh, if their data matches the use case where it, uh, where it works. And so these, uh, this is our specific goal. And uh, SwiftStack and Intel and Box are uh, very actively contributing and uh, working towards this specific goal uh, in Swift. And so that, that leads me to where we're going. Uh, my vision for Swift is that everyone every day will use Swift whether they realize it or not. And I think we're well on our way to this goal, looking at the fact that uh, we've got major cloud providers with their thousands and thousands of customers use, uh, using Swift, uh, and transitively their customers are using Swift. Uh, so that's people like Rackspace and Enovance and HP, uh, IBM now that they've uh, have acquired software. Uh, we've got major uh, end user applications uh, that are, have announced about their using Swift, everything uh, from people uh, like uh, doing mobile gaming to uh, companies like Concur to companies like uh, organizations like Wikipedia. Uh, and these, uh, these are what's really exciting to me. So I think that looking at our growing contributor base, uh, looking at the growing number of production deployments in real world applications, uh, and when people are looking uh, for deploying uh, storage that is highly durable, has high availability, and supports massive concurrency, uh, people are choosing Swift. And this is because it's powering some of the world's largest storage clusters today. And so I think absolutely uh, this is our vision. Uh, this is absolutely achievable. And uh, I'm really excited about the future. So I wanted to say thank you for your time. Um, and uh, I have a few minutes for questions. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Appreciate your flexibility. It looks like Jonathan had a couple questions, but maybe one of them was answered. Jonathan, um, first of all, I assume we, everyone can get a copy of the slides at some point. Um, I'll give them to okay. you. Okay, right, and I'll, and I'll post them. Thank you. And then uh, there was a question about what is, col what is colder data? But I think maybe you answered that. I think colder data here is colder. just uh, uh, relative uh, I'm not going to put specific numbers. It's a little bit different for every use case. But basically, data that is accessed less frequently but must still be available uh, in the context of Swift. So uh, for example, if you're storing backups, uh, your goal is that you would never need them. But when you do need them, you need them. And you need to be able to get them. 
pass. I think that's a perfect example of uh, cold data as opposed to hot data, which may be uh, something that is, for example, like the images stored on Wikipedia. Uh, those are uh, actively uh, accessed and uh, frequently accessed. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Rags, you can ask a question via audio, assuming it's semi quiet where you are. One person wants to ask. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Rags from Rackspace, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Hey, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about uh, high availability of the proxy nodes? Um, you know, I know that, uh, you know, uh, Replicas of data that that takes care of high availability and disaster recovery. Uh, but but what about the proxy nodes? Is there some recommendations yeah, or you know how does it work? Is there some practices? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so if I, I think we broke up a little bit there, but I think the question is basically okay. So talk about uh, the high availability of the proxy nodes, and I'd be happy to because it's great and it's something that Swift is always uh, supported. Uh, Swift's architecture, of course, as you know, has uh, proxy nodes uh, talking to storage nodes in the back end. And the storage nodes are where the data is stored. Uh, this is massively scalable, and that's, that's where that's, uh, uh, the proxy node coordinates the communication for all of that. But the clients are actually talking to the proxy nodes. And so to have a high availability cluster, uh, not only for uh, working around hardware failures, but even just to do typical operational tasks like upgrading live clusters, uh, you need to have a, the ability for these proxy nodes to come and go as, as they may. And so this is uh, absolutely something that's been supported day one, uh, since day one in Swift. And the way this works is basically twofold. One is that there is no central uh, point of communication or central point of failure or simple, uh, central knowledge sharing point within a Swift cluster. So uh, any, any request that comes to any proxy server can handle uh, uh, can be handled. And uh, what this means then is when you need to scale out the, the amount of concurrency that you need to support, add more uh, just add more uh, proxy servers. So in order to make these uh, be highly available and to not have to, and to abstract that behind say a single uh, a VIP or domain name, uh, the the answer there is you use a load balancer, and you can have a high availability uh, load balancer pool. And the Swift proxy nodes uh, already support um, health checks uh, with appropriate uh, back pressure um, ability, so that you can, so an operator can very cleanly uh, take a Swift cluster or a Swift proxy node out of that load balancer pool, and uh, traffic will just seamlessly route around that within the Swift cluster. So there's nothing special about a single proxy node. Uh, if you need uh, more throughputs, uh, more concurrency, uh, and to support the high availability use cases, which I contend that everyone does because we need to work around these hardware failures, then uh, add more proxy servers, put that behind the load balancer. There's several uh, ways to build load balancers in front of Swift, whether or not you're using a commercial solution or something uh, open source or using uh, different routing protocols or well, there's just quite a few things there. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Looks like we have two more okay. from Hamza. Sorry, let's see. It's what is um, what is about using flash memory with Swift SSD? Yeah. I think he's asking if that's what you use. Okay. Well, that, that's a great question, and I. Uh, there's, without, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, very specific deployment details, uh, although I'd be happy to, to, an, uh, to answer those uh, later. The, absolutely, and uh, it is possible to do that. Uh, most use cases, uh, well, no, it's, if somebody is looking to build out a highly durable uh, cluster of storage that supports, uh, uh, that needs to be high performance as well, uh, that's when uh, deployers start looking at deploying things or uh, putting things onto all SSDs. Uh, the, uh, there's nothing that uh, there's nothing that really uh, in Swift that requires that uh, for object servers, and there's nothing that necessarily uh, prevents that either. Uh, this is one of the things I'm excited about with uh, the 
the storage policy work is that then deployers will be able to deploy, say, a set of uh, object servers on SSDs and a set of uh, object servers with standard SATA drives, uh, spinning disks, and they will be able to uh, expose those different tiers of performance to their end users. Uh, so absolutely, you can do it today. Um, generally, your bottleneck is networking, not uh, networking between the cluster and the client, uh, rather than uh, single stream throughput. Uh, but yes, absolutely, you can do it. Okay, thank you. And then last one, and then we'll move on to Russell. Um, to be respectful of time, let's say uh, Jeff says, uh, will Swift provide interfaces for hardware? Hardware level storage replication. Hmm. I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to there, Jeff. Uh, but I think uh, you may be referring to things like um, storage appliances that themselves already provide reliable systems, uh, provide reliable storage. So, for example, if you're you know, putting in, uh, you've got NetApps or Isilons or, or something like that. Uh, I think those are some interesting, uh, some interesting things to con uh, consider, especially from a perspective of migrating to Swift uh, away from conventional storage uh, in order to improve performance and lower, lower costs. Um, and this is where some of these abstractions that are being built out to support storage policies actually uh, again, become very interesting because you will be able to isolate. Say, hey, look, here's a here's a traditional storage appliance uh, that I have, and I need to take advantage of my migration plan. So I've got a lot of traditionally deployed storage, and I need to migrate to something that's a little more commodity. Um, and in that sense, uh, I absolutely think that we will see people uh, within this next year doing just that. Uh, building a Swift cluster, taking advantage of the traditional storage architecture, and then migrating to uh, to a more generic commodity Swift uh, hardware setup uh, using the functionality provided by storage clusters. So with that said, I want to say thank you very much. Thank you to Margie uh, and the Foundation. And if you would like to continue, I would, I would welcome your involvement within Swift. Uh, you can always find us in OpenStack Swift on uh, Freenode IRC. And if you're interested in uh, looking at uh, uh, how to get involved, uh, definitely check out the OpenStack website at openstack.org and the Swift developer docs at swift.openstack.org. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, and if anyone has other questions, you can send them to me at margie at openstack.org, M-A-R-G-I-E, and um, I can get those over to John if we missed any. Okay, so let's move over to Russell on the compute side. I believe I'm sharing my screen. Can someone confirm that you, they yeah, can see it? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, amazing. All right. Um, thank you. And I sent you the link to the... Uh to uh, the Google Doc in the uh, chat box there in case anyone else would like to pull that up just in case. Uh, okay. And Go. Okay, great. Thank you. So you may have to read your own questions because I won't see it. But let me see. Sure. I don't want to get yeah, too I fancy, but let me see if I can change the view on this. If I can't, then I'm not going to. Let's see. One second. There. I could be blocking it for a second. One second. There was a, That's about there the was best a I could do. I For, do I go to present? Okay. There was, yeah. Okay. But this is, I mean, this is fine. Too. Okay, one second. We'll give it one more second, then we'll I'll go to present. Okay. All right, let me move this gray box thing, which is semi. Anyway, let's see. Where can this thing go? Okay. Can you see the full screen now? With the gray, yeah. like in the bottom left-hand corner? Okay. Okay, yeah. go ahead. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, again, my name is Russell Bryan. I'm the PTL for the Compute Program, which um, primarily produces the NOVA project. 
And so let's talk about uh, what's been going on with OWA. So if we jump to the next slide here. Um, so what I want to talk about first is uh, a an overview of the Havana release that we released uh, you know, just a couple months ago, um, just prior to the last OpenStack summit. So Nova was one of the founding projects, along with Swift, of OpenStack, but it's still moving um, at a pretty incredible rate. Uh, so blueprints are the system we use in um, the Launchpad site for tracking feature work as well as other major development efforts. And so in the Havana release, we had 93 of those implemented. And you can go look at the full list if you'd like. Uh, there were 800, over 800 bugs fixed, um, over 2,000 changes to the code made. Um, one thing I really like to point out is that was 281 people that contributed code that was merged in that six-month development cycle. Um, and so I think that's pretty exciting. And also, so we take code quality very seriously, both from a, uh, from a lot of angles uh, and across all of OpenStack. And part of that is doing code reviews. And so there were over 18,000 code reviews done that resulted in those 2,000 changes that went in. And so every single change that goes in has to be signed off by at least two people. And, uh, and changes usually go through multiple revisions as we uh, find problems and, and, and so forth. So that's a, so we had, just for the Nova project, over 18,000 code reviews in that development cycle. Also included a URL there for the Havana release notes there at the bottom. Um, that, this, that has sort of a, a more full list of features that we added uh, in Nova as well as other projects. So uh, if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to check that out. But I'm gonna, I'll cover a few, of the, a few of the features that we did um, here today. So if we jump to the next slide here. So one of the things that we've been working on for um, multiple releases is improving upgrades. And this is sort of, this is one of the things that's been one of the, the biggest requests from, from users for, for quite some time, um, especially as, as deployments are getting bigger and bigger. It's another thing I can note about Havana is, you know, as I talk to people, especially at the summit, I, you know, one of the things I like to hear about is, you know, learn about people's deployments, you know, how big is it, you know, what are they doing with, with the software and so forth. And there are uh, de mul many deployments of Nova today in the thousands of nodes um, size, and there are some that are over 10,000 or over 20,000 nodes. So that's the kind of scale that, uh, that we're, we've achieved at this point. So back to upgrades. So with, with that size of scale, um, uh, still on the same slide. I'll let you know when we, when we jump. Um, so with, uh, with that scale, you know, upgrades are more and more important. So one thing we've been working toward is the ability to do, um, to be able to upgrade your Nova deployment without having to take any downtime um, of, your, of your API and control, control plane. So we've been doing a lot of uh, infrastructure build up to support that. And uh, we made a lot of progress in Havana, um, a couple of things uh, in that area. So one of them is this unified object model. So one of the, probably the biggest thing that has been in our way of doing these, these live upgrades is um, the, when we, every release we have changes to the database and the database schema. So you have to take everything down and do migrate your database and then bring everything back up. So we have this object model where we're working to abstract the code base away from the details of the database so that it can also, um, well, one, so the code base isn't so tightly coupled to the, to the current status of the database schema and also having a nice place in the code where we can deal with different versions of the schema um, as necessary as it changes underneath you. So that, we made a, a huge amount of progress there and also uh, this RPC version control thing. So what that's about is Nova is a, a very highly distributed system like uh, every other part of OpenStack and we use uh, messaging between services on multiple nodes, you know, as they talk to each other, usually A and QP. And all these versions, are, uh, all these interfaces are versioned. That was something that we did a, a couple of releases ago. And one thing that we've added is not only did these interfaces have to be versioned, but we have to have some control over what version things speak as we're progressing through uh, an upgrade. And, and while you're while you have a situation where your, your deployment has a mix of different versions. We have to have more control over what everything's speaking to make sure everything in this mixed deployment understands the messages being sent. So we have uh, more control over that now. So I'll talk a little bit more about upgrades uh, later when we get to the ice house release. So we jump to the next slide here. Another thing that we improved in Havana is cells. So cells is a, it's, a, it's an optional, uh, it's a deployment choice 
it's a way of deploying Nova uh, such that you have uh, you break it up into these high level clusters. Um, you have an API cell and then you have compute cells. And every uh, compute cell has its own database and its own uh, message broker. And so it does it does a couple of things. One of it um, one thing is for scalability. So if you if your deployments uh, if your deployment as you scale up, if the limits you're hitting are the, the database and the message broker, then you break your computes into cells and then you can bypass that. So that was one of the primary things. But it also lets you have um, large compute clusters that are geographically um, separated uh, under, the same, under the same Nova API. So um, that's something that's still, in, you know, we, we're still doing a lot of development on cell support and Havana adds some features. And one of those was Cinder. So before Havana, a Cinder was not supported. Um, live migration is now supported uh, between um, compute nodes within a cell. And then also we have a new scale scheduler. So in a traditional Nova deployment, the, um, the scheduler is a, is a pretty fundamental component. What the scheduler does is that when a request comes in to, to start a VM somewhere, it, it makes that decision of where it's going to go. And in a cell deployment, uh, scheduling is in two stages. So the first stage is cell scheduling. Which cell is this uh, request going to? And then within the cell, it does the host level scheduling. So the cell scheduler now works just like the host level one in that it's a, it's a filter-based scheduler and you can add um, filters and weights to, add, uh, you know, to do some more advanced uh, logic there. So that is nice and handy. So let's jump to the next slide here. Um, last, another uh, last point I wanted to make about the Havana features that we added is, is improved center integration. So one thing, so Nova makes pretty heavy use of lots of other OpenStack services. They're always looking on, looking at new ways we can enhance that uh, that integration. And so that was one, you know, we did some of that here. One thing that we now support is encryption of uh, your um, sender block storage volumes. Um, Another thing is improved block device mappings. If you've ever um, used the Nova API for for setting up block device mappings, um, it previously was was it was actually pretty difficult to use. Um, the syntax is nicer now. You've also got a lot more control over the bus type that's used to attach um, volumes to to an instance. So you can sp you know, specify whether something's going to be attached to. As a floppy or a CD-ROM or 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 otherwise, for for example, another thing that was uh, that we made nicer was the workflow needed to to be able to boot an instance that's volume back. So I'll commonly referred to as boot from volume, and that workflow is a lot easier. Previously, you had to you had to kind of jump around between sender and glance and Nova to kind of to get that up and running. You had to go to sender and create the create a volume from the image, and then um, go to Nova and try to move from it. And it was just it was not terribly straightforward, but now you can do that in a, in a single operation from Nova. So it's a lot easier to use. So that's that's some Havana highlights. So now let's jump up to, to Ice House. We can go to this next slide and start talking about Ice House. So Ice House is the current release that we're working on right now. Uh, it started roughly at the, the OpenStack Summit and we're actually quite well on our way uh, to Ice House. So we're working on the second development milestone. So so Ice House is a six-month development cycle, and it's made up of a few development milestones, and then we switch into release candidate mode, and then we go to the, the full release. Um, so we've already released the first development milestone, and we're, we've started working on the second one. So just to give you kind of a quick high-level view of the work that's already happened, like I mentioned before, blueprints are the things that we used for, for tracking the work. We've got 130 of those targeted. Um, not, we, we don't know yet how many of those or which ones uh, for sure will get finished, but that's all the things that people have said that they intend to to uh, complete for the Ice House release. And you can go take a look at that at the link there at the bottom, the Launchpad link. Uh, we've, we're getting close to 300 bugs already fixed. Um, we've uh, merged almost 700 changes, and we've already had over 6,000 code reviews on, those, on all these changes. Um, it's just the beginning of the development cycle so far. All right, let's jump to the next page. So one of the things we're aiming, a big thing we're aiming for in Ice House is like I mentioned earlier that we've been working on live upgrade support for a few releases and a lot of that's just been working on this, working on a lot of necessary infrastructure to make that work. And we're attempting to support uh, live upgrades from Pavana to Ice House. Um, 
and a lot of that's, you know, finishing up some of the infrastructure we've been doing. I mentioned this object model that we did in Vana. There's still work to do to convert the entire code base over to that. Some of it is changing the way we do database migrations. Uh, so so database, database migrations some t can either be changing the schema and also it may be doing data, data migrations. And we're trying to do less data migrations uh, there and do, do them more as a, as a live or lazy data migration while the service is running. So that'll allow, uh, anyways, it allows to do the, the, the offline data, uh, DB migration a lot faster. Um, and then we have a lots of uh, interface versioning between the different services. We've got a lot of rules around that, so just continuing to make sure that we strictly uh, adhere to those rules that we've set. Uh, and also we have some uh, infrastructure work to set up testing around this to make sure we don't break it, because it's really easy uh, to break this along the way if we're not careful. So hopefully we'll be able to, um, right now, it looks like we will be able to support this, and, and that's our plan unless we hit, hit something that we can't work around, but I, I think we'll be able to do it. So jump to the next one. The other thing that we have uh, doing is, is sort of another thing around code quality. Uh, we do a whole lot of continuous integration testing in, across OpenStack. And right now, most of that is done against the, at least for Nova, is done against the Libbird driver, which is the driver used for KVM virtualization. And that makes it tough. Um, so that's great for, for that driver, and it's, it's not as great for everything else. Uh, we don't have as much confidence and, and changes to any other drivers because we don't have this continuous integration going to telling us that it's working. So one thing we just thought, we decided this last cycle is that we want to build up continuous integration across every driver. And, um, and, any, uh, so, and there's been good progress on that, both uh, for all the drivers actually, there's good progress. Um, Thin server uh, has been a lot of progress. Um, the VMware team has a system up and running now reporting test results and other teams have, uh, have made plans around working on these things. So we should have uh, much expanded test infrastructure, which of course should result in a higher quality result for everyone. Let's jump to the next slide here. Um, the, the REST API that the Nova implements, um, right now it's at version two. We've been working on a version three of that. It's got a, well, it's got a lot of changes and some of it's removing deprecated stuff. So for example, uh, block storage uh, volume support used to be something built into Nova and it was split out into the sender project and its own API. So we need to, a new rev of the API to remove that stuff that's no longer necessary. There's a whole lot of consistency cleanup, both in formatting of data, the way we name things, the, the resp uh, response codes, all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's also some things that we have <coughs> been putting off to a new API to be able to do because there's such fundamental changes to the way the API works. And one of those is a, a, new, uh, a new tasks API. So an example is if you want to go boot a new VM, right now um, you don't have a whole lot of really good insight into that process. So it, it, sometimes it takes a little while. Um, it has, you know, it's going off and might have to download an image. It has to set, set up networking. Um, and just, just various aspects of that. So what we want to do is, or what we have been doing, is doing a lot of restructuring of our code base to be able to better track um, these long-running run, long running operations in terms of tasks and subtasks. And uh, we're gonna, we want to expose that via the API. So when you kick off a long-running task, such as starting a, a virtual machine or, or doing a live migration, uh, you'll have an API to get better insight into the various things necessary um, to make that happen, you can monitor progress, and if something fails in the middle, you'll have much more detailed into insight into what the failure was and when it happened. So that is uh, actively under development. So next slide. Um, one thing we're looking at. So I guess Nova historically, um, you know, we've we've split out multiple things. Nova is a, a pretty massive project, and various pieces get split out over time. And one thing we're looking at splitting out right now is the scheduler. So as OpenStack has grown, we have more and more services. There are uh, schedulers in, in each of these projects, and it turns out there's lots of overlap between them, both between code, but probably more importantly, the data uh, and information about the deployment that all these schedulers really want to know about. Um, it, there's a lot of overlap there, so it would it would be nice if we had a common uh, scheduler such that um, you know we can do a lot of this uh, decision making from 
from one service that, that has access to all, to all this information. Um, but we're starting that by taking the existing scheduler code in Nova and splitting it out into its own service, and that's actually well, under, well underway. And hopefully that will eventually lead to, lead to being able to do lots of uh, more advanced cross-service scheduling stuff. All right, and next, next slide, just real quick note. Um, you know, I mentioned that we have these, all these blueprints, um, but you know, that, that doesn't mean it's uh, too late to show up with something new. If anyone else out there has something that you'd like to see in Nova, uh, you, you know, you're just as welcome and encouraged as anyone else to, to come to bring your new stuff, and there's, there's still plenty of time. And with that, I can take some questions. And the last slide there has any contact information, has some contact information for me if anyone would like to get in touch with me later. Great. And if you don't uh, mind looking in the chat, I, I can't see yeah, it right now, but I can. I, I, see, um, I see a question there. What encryption methods are supported for Cinder, and is it possible to plug in an encryption method? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, to be quite honest with you. So I don't have a, there's a, I have a hard time keeping detailed context about the feature in my head for Nova when, uh, because of how many, how many we're doing. So no, I don't, unfortunately, I don't remember the answer to that one. Yeah, Russell, that's fair. This is Rags uh, who asked the question, but uh, do you know if uh, you know um, you can plug in an encryption method? Or um, again, that's detail. Uh, well, question. the well, so part of it is um, the more of the in actual encryption part of it is actually over on Cinder and not Nova. So okay. I didn't, I don't have okay. much. Uh, I hadn't looked at that side of the code as much. Um, a lot of the Nova support is a little bit more. Kind of, there's, it's it's it, it's it's a whole lot of infrastructure code and kind of glue code, uh, making sure that we can utilize what the encryption stuff that was done in Sender. Um, part of what is in Nova is some key management code, and that stuff is pluggable um, for different uh, to depending on what key manager you want to use. Uh, right now, the the code that's there is pretty primitive, but for example, we expect to add a driver for Barbican, which is a a, yeah. a, an emerging OpenStack project for, for doing key management. Um, and I suspect there may be drivers for other things too. So, I mean, uh, yeah, but the, as far as the actual encryption uh, methods, I, I'm not really sure. I know it has to be pluggable to some degree because, um, you know, yeah. Sender, just like uh, most other projects, has, have lots, has lots of different storage backends and different technologies, and, and it has to be pretty uh, flexible to be able to, to do encryption in whatever the way that, you know, the backend storage appliance does it. Thank you, Russell. Um, let's see. Jonathan asks, um, what about support for Solaris compute nodes since Oracle is, is now sponsoring OpenStack? Um, as far as I know, I have not seen any uh, code contributions from anyone at Oracle. Um, so right now, there's no support for that, and I can't really offer any for information on, on potential support for it, uh, really. Um, yeah, the support doesn't exist, and I don't really have any timeline for it, I guess. All right, well, if anyone else has a question, if you think of any questions later, um, feel free to contact me. Uh, one last question looks like, what about Hyper-V? Um, Hyper-V is supported. Um, we've had a driver there for for a while, and it's, um, it's under uh, reasonably active development. Okay, yes. Um, the company in Europe, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to make, make sure, that I, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a company that, that works on contract of, uh, by Microsoft to, to continue to maintain Hyper-V support. So it's there. It's supposed to work. Again, it's, um, and hopefully they, uh, from what I understand, they are working on uh, some continuous integration infrastructure, so you should see test results from that soon, too. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Russell, and thank you, John, and thank you, everyone, for your participation today. Hope you all have a nice holiday season. And if you have any other questions, you can contact Russell, John, or you can send me questions as well. Thanks and that much. concludes our meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.